Hello everyone, my name is Morgan Baker and today we will be discussing accessible horror. Everyone is entitled to one good scare for this year's Grux 2021. And if you've already seen this talk, shh, no spoilers, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and let these two lovely ladies introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Tara Velker and I'm an accessibility lead for Xbox Game Studios and I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the tropes that we see in horror games that leave people out on having a good scare. Hello everyone, my name is Emiliane Chiasson and I am the accessibility lead for Square Enix West and I am here today to talk to you about the history of accessibility in horror media. And I am Morgan Baker. I'm the accessibility lead and game designer for The Odd uh, Gentleman, and I'm going to be talking about best accessibility practices for the horror genre. Let's just go ahead and dive straight into it. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this part of the talk, which is called The History of Horror Media from Silent Films to Books to Modern Cinema and Games. I am Amé, or Emiliane, and I'm here to tell you all about it. But before we start, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Um, my slides tend to be a little bit text heavy. Um, that's just to ensure that I respect the allocated time that we each have for our parts. Um, but feel free to read or listen to me if you prefer. And we also will make these slides available after um, the talk. So do not worry if you miss anything. Uh, those slides will be available after the talk. So let's start at the beginning. <laughs> um, there is a variety of different approaches uh, when we want to induce fear, right? So all of these different approaches still have one intent uh, to scare us. We can look at books, for example, you know, like Stephen King or, you know, uh, here we have Tenerife Dew uh, and different you know, horror books that, uh, you know, come in different shapes and form uh, when it comes to their stories and the type of characters that they portray. Um, some of them are made for younger audiences, like Goosebumps, um, or some of them are made for a more older audiences. And um, they all kind of use different approaches, obviously, when it comes to storytelling, but they all use storytelling and efficient writing to induce fear anxiety and make us imagine our own worst nightmares because when it comes to novels for example um contrary to comics for example um we don't have imagery to support what we're reading so everything happens in our heads and that can be very terrifying um tv and cinema also uses the power of storytelling obviously but now we have more layers more added layers we now have images sounds and acting performances which can really 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 uh, uh drive <laughs> you know the goal home when it comes to inducing fear in its audiences we have um movies that are silent as well and we're gonna get into that just a little bit in, in a little bit but um you know movies are a very very powerful way to uh you know create horror content and we've seen a variety of different uh, uh, types of horror, you know, and types of stories. It can be monsters, gory, uh, psychological thrillers, and different types of horror that will go and tap into that fear of ours in different ways. And again, same thing for video games. Uh, it uses all of the above storytelling images, um, sounds, um, acting performances. In many ways here, it's more voice acting performances. Um, but now there's a, a little bit uh, of a difference and that's the direct interaction that the user can have with uh, your experience. So that adds a whole other level of immersion that the other mediums uh, may not have um, and that can make your experience way scarier. So now, like I said, if we just go back a couple years to now <laughs> what feels like a lifetime ago. Um, we have the era of silent films, uh, which is oftentimes considered the golden era in the cultural history of the, Amer of the American deaf community. Um, the only reason why I'm focusing on that right now is just because, well, we don't have a, a lot of time <laughs> today to cover uh, the entire history of horror media. Um, but um, I did want to touch upon that because it is one of the most obvious um, places that we can point at when it comes to a cultural shift in uh, horror culture culture because in the past with uh, silent films um, we were using intertitles sometime called um, title cards in order to convey um, character dialogue obviously and there were no spoken words and so that made it a, an experience that was 
quite accessible um, to deaf people because they could go to the cinema and uh, experience a very similar type of experience as any other of the theater goers at the time. Unfortunately, Bye bye inter <laughs> titles because uh, when talkies arrived, talkies being uh, sound films, um, these title cards started to become more and more rare, and nowadays we barely see any at all. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sound films, we've grown to love and hate them. And obviously there's been different approaches to try and make those more accessible. But overall speaking, you know, these experiences in themselves are oftentimes not very accessible. Um, and that goes for, uh, you know, movies and games um, alike and any other type of, you know, uh, horror content that does contain um, sounds uh, uh, on the screen, whether it be through dialogue or um, uh, sound effects, uh, ambience, music, uh, etc. Over the years, you know, there's been still different approaches to try and re-embrace um, live dialogue movies. Um, silent movies, movies themselves are extremely rare nowadays, but we have seen movies that have tried to limit dialogue as much as possible. Um, like in Drive, for example, Ryan Gosling speaks a total of 891 words in the movie. Um, and that's not a lot. And so that's interesting to see because, you know, a lot of movies don't necessarily dare to do that because, you know, we've been, we're used to the new tactics, the new practices, but it doesn't mean that you can't explore what the past has done for us. And, you know, the past has built very strong foundation uh, when it comes to horror media. So definitely go check that out uh, if you're doing research about making your own um, horror experience. Um, films like A Quiet Place as well are very light in dialogue um, and also represent um, a deaf actress. Um, and, you know, so there are places that you can look into how to make things differently. Um, so I invite you to do your homework and go and dig into the past of horror media because there is a very, very, very rich uh, database of um, movies, uh, games, uh, books, uh, even theater uh, pieces that you can look into. And I definitely invite you to do that. And we're not going to get into that today per se. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to movies because we're trying to focus on video games but I did want to touch upon it because I think that's very important and also relevant to whenever you're making these stories for your games and casting also your voice actors and also making characters um, in, in, your, in your game is the representation <laughs> that occurs um, in horror films, TV and that's worth a whole other talk, honestly, but just very quickly uh, to say, uh, when it comes to representation, obviously there is a big problem in Hollywood and elsewhere <laughs> where, uh, you know, people who are playing uh, disabled characters, for example, are not people who are disabled, in, you know, in real life. Um, and that is an issue because there is a plethora of disabled talents that are there and available <laughs> to work. And they're not being hired because uh, people who are all either already known in Hollywood are being prioritized over them or people who are non-disabled are prioritized just because uh, there is this myth that it can be harder to work with a disabled actor or talent um, or that it's more expensive or you know that it, it's it's it has it has a whole layer of, uh, of complexity to making a, a piece of a piece of content um, which is all just BS, pardon, pardon my French, um, but yeah, definitely take the time to, if you're going to be, you know, making disabled um, characters and try to, you know, have a message of inclusion, uh, when, whether it be disability um, or, you know, sexual orientation or, you know, including people of color, you know, LGBTQ plus community, make sure that you go and talk to these communities before, you know, building a whole story based on, you know, what you assume, you know, uh, uh, these communities go through or how they, you know, live their lives and how they talk and how they express themselves. It's very important and not just have consultants, but also make sure that if you're going to have a disabled character, cast a disabled actor that can really, you know, push that performance to its best, honestly. So this slide will be available afterwards if you want to read it. But yeah, there's a bunch of, you know, horror movies and TV um, that do this, you know, sometimes both right and wrong in the same, you know, piece of horror. Sometimes 
there's some wins, sometimes there's some losses there and some fails, but ultimately, again, if you do your homework, you will find a plethora of information when it comes to representation um, in uh, horror media. So uh, now that feels a little overwhelming and you might be left with a couple of different questions like, so are sound films automatically scarier than silent films? Are video games automatically scarier than movies overall? And are movies automatically scarier than books? Ah, well, no, <laughs> that's the short answer. The long answer is that it's complicated. Um, you know, obviously you can create fear in so many ways. Uh, sometimes it's the unknown that induces fear. Sometimes it's guts and blood. And sometimes it's, you know, a scary monster. Sometimes it's jump scares and creepy music. Or, you know, sometimes it's like a creepy voice, for example. And... <laughs> it's weird. Oh, it's back. Okay, my bad. <laughs> I apologize. Um, and sometimes it's a still image of a long, empty, dark hallway that will haunt us. So that may all sound scary, no pun intended, but making a scary horror experience, you know, even though it can feel complex, and, and it is like in, like making any other type of, you know, uh, media, whether it be a movie or a video game, it is so worth it. Uh, horror is one of the most impactful, lasting, and powerful subgenre of entertainment, and it has also one of the most active and loyal community, hashtag horror fam, in pop culture. It is the subject of so many studies on culture, psychology, and media. We often love it when it's bad, even, so don't be afraid to dare, because worst case, you can become a meme. <laughs> I'm sure that many of you can hear that, that quote in your head. So here are some quick takeaways, um, you know, from this part of the talk. So regardless of the media, not one piece of horror does it the same. The, har the, ar the art, my apologies, of scaring someone comes in many different forms, and it's been forever evolving over the course of history. That being said, um, terror knows no era nor bounds, so definitely don't hesitate to go dig back way back and kind of like use all the information you know throughout history to um you know do your research when you're creating a, a piece of horror content because there this is it's so rich and it's so important um scaring people is not easy and you know we acknowledge that um but it is also one of the richest opportunity to try different approaches because you know uh this is where accessibility comes into play and it is one of the perfect mindset towards innovation and standing out as a creator so don't fall into tired tropes dare to try and make a, a piece of you know accessible horror um content really and you you won't regret it so right before we leave i just wanted to say thank you for um okay um i'll be i'll be right back um tara if you can just you know if you can just uh, cut that i'll just restart the ending at the end okay weird um anyway I, I guess i'll continue with my section so now we've learned a little bit about the history of sort of the horror genre in general i'm going to talk specifically about some of the inaccessible tropes that we see time and time again in horror games and i want to be clear here i'm going to pick these games apart because I love them dearly. I know what these tropes are because I play horror games all the time. And the reason that I'm doing this, the reason that we're having this talk is because we love the genre and we want to be able to bring it to more people. And I cannot stress, I love horror games. That's why we're doing this. But horror games aren't perfect. They make mistakes. Let's set the scene here. 
You're walking down a, down a dark, dark hallway. And then suddenly you hear behind you, a telephone. It's ringing. You turn around slowly. You walk forward and you pick it up. And a story advances. What game is that from? Well, actually, that's from, like, a million different horror games. And to provide some specific examples, it's you in Resident Evil Village. It's you in P.T. It's you in The Medium. It's you in literally so many horror games. I could probably make just a talk on horror video games that feature phones ringing that don't have any visual indicators. It's a big problem in horror. And honestly... Sound-based cues in general are a big deal in horror games, and they're frequently informing players where they need to go next to advance the story. But we're really seeing the same things over and over that aren't really being captured in any way. Obviously, and I'm not I'm going to keep stressing this, the first being, being ringing telephones. But the other circumstances, and one I see all the time, are doors locking or unlocking frequently behind you. Think about it. You're in a game, you solve some intricate puzzle, and then somewhere behind you, a door has unlocked, a cabinet has opened, something. But there's only an audio cue. And if you don't see it, then don't hear it and you don't see it, you don't know that it's happened. But there's also frequently things that are supposed to draw your attention to some place that you don't know about. A loud crash or bang. Again, that you're supposed to hear and then follow to advance the story. But if you're hard of hearing or deaf, you may not know about it. But really, I mean, we can go beyond, beyond just story advancing sound cues to talk about sounds in general. I mean, while we're on the topic, Mood setting is obviously a huge part, but there's more than just that. A lot of horror games specifically have proximity monitors about how close you are to baddies, and they're using audio for it. You can think back to the first Silent Hill game. The radio would go off when you were near baddies. Radio. What's going on with that radio? But even in modern games like Dead by Daylight, you hear the heartbeat when you're close to the killer. But if you can't hear that heartbeat, but honestly, there are so many warnings, sometimes literal audio warnings about things that are happening, like maybe you're on a space station and losing oxygen for decompression, that people don't have any information on. You know, and the number of times there's something around the corner or around the door or through that hallway that you're getting ready to go through, that as a hearing person, I know there's something scary right over there. But, you know, it's not frequently shown in an accessible manner which sucks. But one of my favorite things about horror game is the world building. They have such rich lore, feeling, atmosphere, and that's what draws so many people in. And I think that's why in horror games you see so many things that provide more information from audio logs, to diaries, to medical journals, to occasionally the message Girls in blood on the wall. But those are also frequently inaccessible. They can be really, really hard to read. And it sucks when that happens because if you can't read the blood on the wall that says cut off their limbs, you may not immediately know how to kill those aliens in dead space. Sometimes they're clues to puzzles, sometimes they're information on the characters, but when they are put in these low contrast environments with these weird fonts in a way that you can't quite get a good look at, people can really lose out. They just can't read what it says. Which again, they're amazing in terms of the world building, so it sucks when people get left out. And I want to say that the worst example, um, but what I love is whenever you're doing any sort of gothic horror that has a diary with beautiful cursive handwriting that, I mean, honestly, even a lot of kids today never learned cursive. It just sucks that they can't get into that. But you know what sucks more? Insta-death. One of the things that horror games are great at are giving you this panic, and that's the experience you're signing up for. But sometimes that panic can 
really end up setting you up for failure and you'll have to retry things. So a lot of horror games have QTEs, quick time events, where you very quickly have to make a split second decision. And if you mess up, well then you're dead. And depending on the game, it can mean you've lost a massive chunk of progress and you have to replay. Or for games that you make wrong choices in, especially if you have to read, it gets compounded. So let's say that perhaps you have a prompt on screen that you're reading and you have to respond quickly. Well, if you're dyslexic, you may have messed that up and now you've made the wrong choice and now you're dead. That was it, really quickly, before you even had time to process what was happening. And of course, one of the things that we love about horror games are the big baddies. And the biggest baddies, oh, you gotta be careful. Because if they get you, you're dead. But you know what sucks? Replaying that same fight over and over because you just really suck at dodging that massive hammer he's throwing at your head. Or maybe it's a chainsaw to your neck. Either way, it's progress lost. And you have to do it again. And when you repeat it, it loses its fun. And one of the things that, again, are all about atmosphere and world building in horror games are these visuals, which are frequently full of fog and darkness and extreme shadows. And they are beautiful, but it can make the environment harder to navigate. It can make it so that you miss key elements or in terms of having things that you can interact with, you may literally not be able to locate those items because they're blending into the world and they don't have contrast. There's nothing worse than circling the same room six times because you missed that little prompt that said that you were supposed to pick up this necklace that goes in this jewelry box. Again, beautiful, they set the scene, but if you can't play it, does it really matter? how beautiful and creepy your fog is? Probably not, because if I have to keep walking around in it, it'll eventually lose its luster anyway. And all of these things really do come together in what can be a massive sensory overload for players. First off, you're scared when you're playing horror games. That's on purpose, that's the challenge. But I think we all know that everything gets harder when you're scared. And it's something that was difficult is now more difficult. And on top of the anxiety that you're experiencing, you're probably having flashing lights, enemies, you're managing your weapons, your ammo, and sometimes the UI even gets more complex as you're playing the game or you're reducing your field of vision because you've been hurt. And that really can overload players. It's something that happens all the time in horror games, unfortunately. And really, the last thing is uh, not even a trope we're going to address here today, but, you know, don't even get me started on the representation- <laughs> Oh, well, that's weird. Huh. I- I'm gonna go see what's setting off my Sam. Hold on. Hello? Hello? Wait, did y'all hear something? Anyway, now we've learned a bunch about the genre of horror as well as how horror games can be inaccessible, so what do we do about it? And don't worry witches, I got you. What do we do first about insta-death? Well, we can limit or even remove it. QTEs make them optional in your settings. If someone picks the wrong choice, oh, let them try again without any sort of major repercussions. Dying to the same boss over and over again because it's ridiculously difficult? Just let players change the difficulty, or better yet, bypass. Losing progress too often, put in frequent checkpoints and let players manually save. Let's take the dark pictures. The game offers holdable QTEs and no-fail options, making the gameplay more accessible to a wider range of players. Streamer Paige Artemis Harvey brings light to this feature with the quote, With holdable QTEs and no-fail options, you've made this disabled horror lover so, so happy. Hooray <laughs> for no more button mashing, I'd just love to see that. And speaking of button mashing, Dead for a Day 
or dead by daylight, I cannot say it, uh, recently added a button mashing replacement, one of the most highly requested features within this game. Rather than mashing buttons to escape, players can now do a simple skill check, which becomes kind of progressively harder every single time. The developer notes in the quote, the goal isn't to make struggling harder or make you get sacrificed faster, it's just to make it easier on your fingers, and players were thrilled by the options. And though this game was released in 2016, this feature was added in April 2021, proving that it is never too late to add accessibility to your game, even in the horror genre. Shifting over, we can add more modes within the game options menu itself. Yes, we can let players like adjust the difficulty, uh, but we can also go a little bit deeper than that. For example, we can add modes to reduce sudden scares or assist modes or apply filters such as a profanity, nudity, or gore filter. The game Trenches actually offers a no jump scare mode, seen in the title menu as the second option circled on the sides. <laughs> How cool is that? You can also take the game Soma, like S-O-M-A. On the left, the game mode is set to normal, where monsters are dangerous and can kill you, but on the right, you can change the game to safe, which still makes the game super creepy. The monsters are very terrifying looking, but they can't kill you anymore. And it's really nice because the game is very much narrative driven, so you can still play the game if stealth is a barrier for you. As Tara mentioned, it's also pretty common to see horror games without subtitles or closed captions, or rather, proper ones, that is. Captions and subtitles should be short and to the point and display at the right time. I cannot tell you how many moments where, like, it's completely ruined for me because the caption comes up before the actual sound happens. Like someone wants to do a surprise stabby stabby, well if the caption happens before it, it kind of takes the fun out of it. They should also have the captions be appropriate, meaning captions should only include pertinent gameplay, which yes, this does include atmosphere and caption audio cues, such as please caption the telephones, I'm deaf, I don't know if the phone is ringing, so please caption it, help, help a girl out. And most importantly, give players the options to customize the captions, which is extremely important, especially for the horror genre. As designers, though, rather than subtitling everything, we can also use visuals to our advantage. Because, let's be honest, sometimes sound is just a mess, y'all. This can come in a number of forms, whether it's like UI UX, HUD, all the way to messing with the environment, such as like lighting and moving objects. For example, going back to the phone, uh, sure, yes, please caption it please. But if the timing is supposed to be sudden or jarring, you can flicker all the lights except for the one over the phone or just flicker the light over the phone or have the phone shake in front of the player so it's whoa, whoa, a sudden movement that's spooky. It makes the gameplay not only more accessible but also more interesting for those who may not be using audio. And you can still call upon classic horror to make this really good as Ame has previously referenced. However, you still want to make sure that sound is still there. In fact, consistent sound is the key for many players, especially those with vision disabilities or those who require multiple modalities. So please use sound design still, it's very important. But what do we do about sensory overload? Well, we give players the control, let them pause without repercussions, let them adjust the brightness, let them reduce the number of players or enemies, or make them easier, give weapon options and let them change the UI, let them adjust the volume with separate sliders, and the list goes on forever. The idea is though, is letting players essentially customize things can reduce sensory overload in the long run. But you can also too think about it and bake it in as well, making sure that you don't do things, for example, sudden flash that could cause something like a uh, seizure, which is just not good in general for any game. Let's take the game Horror Tales The Wine. Players can change the size of all in-game text with a sire and select between a number of eight different styles ranging from different colors and backgrounds for the actual text. I mean, just look at this text on the screen. It is massive, it is beautiful, it is a masterpiece, and you can make it way bigger than this in the game as well. 
Tara also brought up creepy writing on the walls that can sometimes be illegible. You don't need to necessarily remove this from your game, but instead you can provide an accessible way to essentially read it. For example, in Resident Evil Village, they do this in two forms. The first, as currently displayed on the screen, is it'll show the text in a legible font right underneath the nose. So you can still read on here, February 2nd, 2021, Rose's half birthday. But the second way they do it as well is players can open up a text box uh, to essentially read it with ease and efficiency. Here there is a note on a fridge and players are being asked to press A or F to examine it. And if they press F, boom! Now all of a sudden we get a nice little text box with legible writing. Um, it's a list of groceries, which I guess that makes sense to put that on a refrigerator. Other visual barriers include lights, shadows, and colors, and we want to make sure that players can increase the brightness but also turn off certain effects that might obscure vision, for example, let them turn off fog or rain effects, and let them change the saturation, the gamma, the gain, the contrast. It won't take away from the game. I super pinky swear that this is very helpful for the horror genre. Horror Tales The Wine once again takes it a step further by adding outlines to pertinent gameplay objects to essentially improve visibility. Here we have a close-up of a broken wine bottle uh, with a nice kind of blue highlight outline so you can see it better in the current broad daylight setting. And here we see again it's in a darker space and the wine bottle is far away and in kind of like a creepy dark cellar, uh, but we still have these very thick blue outlines that are glowing so you can spot the object. It's super clear and it contrasts very well. But if a player needs a hint or if they get lost, what do we do? Help them. <laughs> Take Dead Space, for example, which implements something called deck nav. Uh, you basically hit the right analog stick and a blue line appears showing you the location of the next objective. And though the game is mostly linear, you can actually set objectives to have a little bit more control over this. And don't forget, it's never too late to add accessibility. Dead Space is coming out with a remake, actually, and the devs are going out of their way to add way more accessibility and kind of bake it in or add it as options. The creative director actually notes here, all those elements of accessibility will definitely be something important for us in terms of opening the Dead Space experience to a broader set of people that didn't necessarily have the opportunity or could play the game when it came out. Well everyone, there you have it. Don't forget to bake in the accessibility, add options, and most importantly, please caption your telephones. <laughs> Why are the lights flashing? Do you hear anything? Where's this? Where's the captions? My name is Paul Stockman, and I have a message for you. Make other games accessible. If you don't, someone might come for you. And you won't like that. <laughs> You can find Ame, Morgan, and Tara, or at least what's left of them, on Twitter at the Slasher Chick, Momox Mia, and Lady O'Pair. Special thanks to Paul Stockman, the first cinematic zombie to act of its own free will, and D and Stad. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Platus Cloud. Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.